Curse of the Blue Figurine by John Belairs, Chapter 4. Johnny felt crushed. He felt cheated and humiliated and angry. He had been so sure, so absolutely sure that he had found a genuine bona fide Egyptian magic amulet. And now, to find out that the thing was a souvenir, a crummy, cheap, stupid souvenir, Johnny had souvenirs in his room. One was a small birch bark canoe that he had gotten when he visited Glen Ellis Falls in New Hampshire with his parents. And there was the old crusty bronze handbell with a handle shaped like Father J Junipero Serra, a priest who had explored California in the 18th century. Johnny's uncle had gotten that in California. And he had given it to Johnny. And now, Johnny gazed forlornly at the professor. Are you sure it's a souvenir? He said weakly. I mean, couldn't the label be a fake or something? The professor had stopped laughing. He saw now that Johnny was very disappointed, and he felt sympathetic. I'm sorry, Johnny, she said, shaking his head sadly, but I'm afraid this is a real, genuine souvenir and nothing more. I'm not an Egyptologist. My field is the Middle Ages, but just but this is just the kind of thing that a town like Cairo, Illinois, would peddle as a souvenir. They pronounce it Cairo, by the way. It's a town way down in the southern part of Illinois, and it happens to have the same name as the capital of modern day, as the capital of modern day Egypt. So somebody probably thought it was clever to make a souvenir that looked like an Egyptian ushtabi. A what? Johnny had never heard this strange word before. The professor was astonished. He knew that Johnny had read a lot, and so unreasonably he thought that Johnny ought to know all sorts of obscure things. You don't. Well, I never. Well, all righty then. This is what a ushtabi is. The professor paused and laid the figurine down on the desk. He stubbed out his cigarette, shoved his chair away from the desk, folded his hands in his lap, and stared dreamily up at the ceiling. First, he said, you ought to know that the ancient Egyptians thought the next world, the place you go when you die, would be a lot like this world, and so in the next world people would have work to do, plowing and sowing, carrying water up from the river, making bricks out of clay, and stuff like that. Well, the, to the Egyptians, it didn't seem right that the pharaoh would have to do work in the next world. It would be, well, sort of like making the president of the United States polish his own car. So the Egyptians made these little dolls called Ushtabi. And they were supposed to do the work for the pharaoh in the next world. Sometimes they put whole armies of these Ushtabis in the tomb with the pharaoh. And they come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes they look like dolls, and sometimes they're just miniature mummies, like this one here. The guy who designed this souvenir must have seen an Ushtabi in a museum, and he must have copied it, but this is a souvenir and nothing else. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm afraid that's the case. As Johnny listened to what the professor was saying, he found that he was struggling to find some way of proving that the figurine was really magic after all. Johnny was a stubborn kid about the things he believed. He did not give up easily. But, Professor, he said plaintively, what about F Father Bart and the woodcutter and all that stuff? People always said that the woodcarver gave Father Bart something magic, didn't they? And there's that piece of paper there, with Father Bart's handwriting on it, isn't there? What about that? The professor turned to Johnny. There was a sheepish, sad look on his face. I'm afraid, my boy, he said, that I started all this business by telling you that ghost story. I'm terribly sorry. I deserve to be punched. The trouble with me is I love to tell stories, and I like to make them seem as realistic as possible. Now, it is true that several people have claimed that they saw Father Bart's ghost in the church, and for all I know, they may really think that they did see him. Personally, I don't believe in ghosts except when I'm telling ghost stories. And as for this scroll here, he tapped the paper with his finger. It is Father Bart's handwriting, that much I can tell you. I used to be the official historian of St. Michael's Church, and so I know about things like that. But what does this prove? Not much. The whole business with the book and figurine and the warning note may have been Bart's idea of a joke, or he may have been serious. He may have thought this silly statue really was enchanted. Who knows? Johnny hung his head. Is it all a fake, then? The whole darn story? Did you make it all up? The professor shook his head vigorously. Oh, goodness, no. Most of the details in the story I told you were true. Mr. Herman and Mrs. Mumma really did get killed, and Father Bart really did disappear, but the two deaths were just a coincidence, and I don't think there was anything supernatural about Bart's disappearance. Bart was insane, and he probably had some insane reason for wanting to disappear. 
As for the note that was found in his, on his desk, he probably wrote it himself. It's easy enough to disguise your handwriting if you want to do that sort of thing. The professor paused and flicked the ash off his cigarette. He gave Johnny a hangdog guilty look. I'm sorry to pull the rug out under you this way. John, he said in a low voice, next time I'll think twice before I tell a ghost story, but please don't think that this blue doojigger is magic. It isn't. Johnny sighed. He wanted to be mad at the professor, but he just couldn't manage it. In spite of his lousy temper, in spite of his love of making things up, the professor was really a nice guy. Johnny could tell that, and he felt that he could forgive the old man for having told a few white lies. At this point, the professor glanced at his watch. He said that he had papers to grade and that he was going to have to chase Johnny out of the house. However, the professor added, grinning slyly, I would like to issue an invitation. This evening after dinner, how would you like to come over for a game of chess and a piece of chocolate cake? I play a superlative game of chess, and the cakes I make are also excellent. How about it? Are you interested? Johnny nodded and grinned. He loved to play chess, but right now he didn't have a partner. Grandpa's game was checkers, and sometimes Johnny got very bored with it. And he was nuts about chocolate cake with chocolate frosting. So it was decided. Johnny would come back after dinner and have dessert. But before he went, he had one more question. What should I do about this stuff? He said, pointing to the book and the two objects that lay inside it. Do you think I should try to take it all back? The professor thought a bit. He drummed his fingers on the desktop. He puffed at his black and gold cigarette. I definitely think, he said at last, that you should not take those things back. In the first place, if Father Higgins or Mr. Famagusta caught you in the basement of the church, there'd be hell to pay. And in the second place, it occurs to me that the blue figurine may be valuable. People collect things, you know. They collect salt shakers and medicine bottles and old flatterons and button hooks. The figurine is only a souvenir, but it's an old souvenir, 60 years old or more. I think you should write to Hobby's magazine and find out if your doohickey is worth something. In the meantime, however, if I were you, I'd keep the thing hidden. If your grandma sees it, she'll ask where it came from. And then where would you be? Just take it back and put it in your closet. First, though, you better make sure the coast is clear. Come on, I'll go down with you and check. Johnny took the book in his arms and followed the professor downstairs. At the front door, they stopped. The professor peered cautiously out. Good, he said, nodding. They're not back yet. You'd better get while the getting is good. Bon voyage, and don't forget about our chocolate cake date tonight. I won't, said Johnny, grinning. Goodbye. While the professor held the door for him, Johnny raced across the street. Into the house he went, and up the stairs to his room. Once again, he put the old black book in the bottom of his closet. Again, he piled stuff on top of it. Then he closed the closet door and went across the hall to wash his hands which were dirty from handling the book. That evening, at dinner, just as Grandma was about to serve dessert, Johnny announced that he had been invited over to the professor's house for cake and a chess game. He announced this shyly and hesitantly, because he didn't know what Grandma's reaction would be. Grandpa was a pretty easy-going sort. He usually let Johnny do what he wanted to, but Grandma was more strict, and she didn't like the professor much. Furthermore, she was proud of her desserts. Johnny didn't want to hurt her feelings or make her angry, but all Grandma said was, Humph, I guess it's all right. And she added in a disparaging tone, I didn't know he baked cakes. Grandma had lived across the street from Professor Childermass for 20 years, but there were a lot of things she didn't know about him. Johnny excused himself and went across the street. He had a great time that evening. The professor was a crafty and merciless chess player. He was every bit as good as Johnny was, and maybe even a little better. As for the cake, well, Johnny had theories about chocolate cake. He felt that the cake part of the cake was just an interruption between the layers of frosting. As it turned out, the professor's opinion about cake were, sim about cake were similar to Johnny's. The cakes he served had three or four thin layers, and the rest was a huge amount of good, dark, thick, fudgy frosting, and he served second helpings, too. Around ten o'clock that night, Johnny said goodbye to the professor and started across the street toward his house. He paused on the curb for a minute or two to look around. It was a beautiful cold winter night. Icicles hung from all the houses, and they glimmered gray in the moonlight. Snowdrifts lay everywhere. In the street were ridges of ice, knotted and iron hard. Johnny blew out his, cloud, his cloudy breath and felt contented. He had made a new friend, he was stuffed with chocolate cake, and he had won one of the three chess games that they played. 
Once more he looked around, and then he stepped forward into the street. And as he stepped, he happened to glance to his left, and he stopped dead. There was somebody standing across the street watching him. Johnny stared. Who was it? He couldn't tell. All he could see was a short, stocky figure standing in front of Mrs. Kovac's house. Hi! called Johnny, waving. No answer. The figure did not move. Oh, well, Johnny thought. It's probably Mr. Swartout. Mr. Swartout was a creepy little man who lived at the end of the street. He never, he never said anything to anybody. Wouldn't give you the time if you asked him for it. Shrugging, Johnny walked straight on across the street and into his house. Later, upstairs, when he was in his pajamas and getting ready to climb into bed, Johnny looked out the window. His bedroom was at the front of the house. From it, you could see, get a good view of the whole length of Fillmore Street. He looked toward the place where the figure had been standing, but there was no one there. For some reason, Johnny felt relieved. Then he peeked at the moon, which was silvering the shingles of the professor's house. Johnny yawned and climbed into bed, and very soon he was asleep. And that's the end of Chapter 4.